mechanical ventilation. Um, I've wanted to do this for a while. Um, let's just go to the next slide if I can figure out how to do that. Uh oh. There we go. So the other end. So I did show you all how to turn on a ventilator and adjust it. So you pick some numbers and you put them in. But that's not what we're talking about. Um, I see, I wrote here why and how to adjust the ventilator. So that's not quite what I'm doing here. I have to change this statement. It's what are you thinking about as you adjust the ventilator, okay. or what you're thinking about when you're ventilating. Um, and my point here is you all have a mental model of breathing. You have a mental model of ventilation. Mm -hmm. I have a mental model. My mental model is different than yours. Um, and every intensivist has a little bit different mental model. Um, I was an engineer before I did uh, medicine. So um, a lot of fluid flow and stuff in chemical engineering. So I have a rather mathematical model, mental model, and I'm gonna give you some of that. Okay. I don't expect you to get all of this. Um, I did an undergraduate in chemical engineering, so I used to know my fluid flow better than I do now, but it helps me with all this stuff. Um, but we're first gonna talk about your mental model, then I'm gonna give you some physiological concepts and measurements, and then we're gonna build a new mental model, which is a mathematical model, and that's it. That's all you need to know. Okay, um, and then how some of these things are applied. So certainly when I'm here, uh, this is how I think about eventually, and I'm gonna talk about that, I'm gonna say I'm doing these things. So it gives you some idea of what I'm talking about. Um, and um, some of those applications, you, and you can, once you have some of these tools and concepts, you can start to look at the wider literature on ventilation. Okay. So, oh, I should go back. How do we breathe? Anyone? So we need to generate like depression in the chest. So no, 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 before that, before that. Why do you breathe? How does it all we start? Oxygen. We need oxygen and we need to expel the CO2. No, no, you're breathing. That, that's what breathing does, but how are you breathing? There you go, brainstem. So all of us have a pattern generator brainstem. Not all of us. There are some people who don't have the pattern generator in their brainstem. In general, central hypoventilation syndrome, they don't have it. But the brainstem signals what? From the brainstem, the signal goes to? Nerves. Easy one. Nerves. Yeah, some phrenic nerves and some other nerves. To? And? Yep. Yeah. And also, and, uh, and that, those muscles create pressure changes. Yeah. Which results in air movement. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably what most, that's, is that right? Is that a mental model of breathing for a medical student? Basically. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and I'm just kind of seeing what your mental model is. First question. So here. Um, as the volume of the chest increases, what happens? So you have negative pressure in the chest compared to the um, relative to outside. Why do you have negative pressure? Because you're expanding the volume and um, already kind of existing volume of air, it's, the pressure drops. Okay. Um, compared to what's kind of outside. And yep. there's a relative difference between that of the outside okay. and inside. So in. as you're increasing your volume, your pressure drops. What's that called? Oh. Boyle's law. Boyle's law. Well, that's law. There's a pressure gradient. There's a pressure gradient. No, nope. Boyle's law is pressure volume relationship. Oh, right. So oh, yeah. in a contained space, yes. uh, same uh, pressure one times volume one equals pressure two times volume two. So if your volume increases, but you want to remain constant, your pressure has to decrease. Okay. That's um, physics. Um, and so I'm actually going to come back to Boyle's Law in a sec. So a lot of different places to measure that pressure. Let's say, so here I have a, oh, oh now I'm doing it here. So pressure, what is pressure? 
This is engineering. Pressure is a force divided by area. The dimensions are mass divided by uh, distance divided by time squared. How do we measure it here? When those numbers come up on the ventilator, what is the unit? You've got a lot of options there. Centimeters for um, yeah, centimeters of water is usually what we use. Yeah. Okay. What is the unit of the art line pressure? Blood pressure. That's at least in mercury. Millimeters mercury. Millimeters, no, millimeters mercury. Okay. But, and what is your partial pressure of carbon dioxide measured on in your gas? Capacitor. Yeah. And, but if you're North America, it's measured in millimeters of mercury. So there are many, many different units of um, pressure measurement. Um, respiratory physiology is centimeters of water. Cardiovascular physiology uses millimeters of water of mercury. Note on the side there that one millimeter of mercury is smaller than a centimeter of water. Um, so what I've done here on the right for centimeters of water, these are in one atmosphere. So atmosphere is a unit of pressure, but one atmosphere equals 101.325 kilopascals or 1.013 bars or 14.7 PSIs or 760 millimeters of mercury also known as TOR, or 1,033.2 centimeters of water. Now, these are, so atmosphere is one, that's an absolute pressure. So we're sitting here essentially at sea level, we have one, one atmosphere of air pushing down on us. Um, but all these numbers we look here are not absolute pressures because the ventilator says 20 centimeters, where it's tw not 20 plus, it is actually 20 plus 1033.2 because the pressure that that ventilator is pushing in is actually from an absolute, from a pure vacuum, it's 1053.2 centimeters of water. But that gets very complicated. So we talk about these are all gauge pressures relative to atmosphere. So as soon as you go relevant to atmosphere, you just, you pick that as your new baseline. That can be positive or negative. So if suction is a negative pressure um, and the ventilators are a positive pressure, blood pressure is a positive pressure, okay? Um, I just noted there, uh, I don't know why I put this, I put this here because we often talk about interpleural pressure in um, respiratory physiology and it's actually very difficult to measure um, interpleural pressure, it's a lab thing. But esophageal pressure is a good approximation of interpleural pressure. Okay. So force divided by area is pressure. This is just, I just want to show you a picture. We can measure a lot of different pressures um, in respiratory physiology, respiratory medicine. Don't worry about them all. So, so anyone, what interpleural pressure do you generate, any one of you? In normal tidal breathing. Okay. Actually, first first question is it negative or positive? Well, it would be fluctuating. Yeah. It's between positive and pressure because essentially every shift that you yeah. And so on inspiration. So it's on inspiration. So if it's inspiration, if it's inspiration, then it's going to not increase the increase the amount of pressure. You're trying to bring air in. So you oh, want it's, it's, it's a negative pressure. It's a negative pressure. pressure. Okay. So your brain stem or your cerebral cortex says, I'm going to breathe in, sends a signal down your your muscles contract, right. increase the volume of your thorax, drop the pressure so air comes in. How much does it drop the pressure on a normal tidal breath? And we'll use interpleural pressure as our we're going to choose that pressure. Okay. Negative what? And I'll give you centimeters of water. Centimeters of water. So, interpreter pressure minus four millimeters of mercury, most minus five. 
you don't have to create much of a negative pressure to get your seven mils per kilo of air in. Okay. You don't have to. It's quite easy to breathe. Now you do it many times a minute, but it's easy. Okay. Um, and for whatever reason, the, the two pictures I got give you the numbers in um, millimeters of mercury. But I think in terms for this respiratory physiology, I think in terms of um, and again, they're using absolute pressures. They're not using gauge pressures. So this is an absolute pressure. This is a gauge pressure. This is an absolute pressure. This is a gauge pressure. Um, and we talk about transformer pressure. OK, so another question. What maximal pressure can you generate? If I want you to work really, really hard, you have a really thick milkshake and you're sucking up on a straw, or I'm you take a big breath in and I, I stuff a pillow over your face and you're trying to breathe out. What kind of pressures can you generate? It's healthy. I'm, I'm, I'm healthy seeing a little picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> over my face. It's not good. Um, you're capable of making a huge negative pressure on me almost in the same way with, uh, with that. So I'm thinking probably minus 30. Higher. Minus 50. More. 100. 100, 120. So notice these are in kilopascals. So it's about 10 centimeters were multiplied by 10. P max for males. P inspiratory max, so the negative pressure, 120. They even got some up to positive 230. Females are a little smaller. But the other thing is, this is not related to, not near as related to age as it is in many other things. Mm -hmm. Pressures aren't, because remember, it's force divided by area. While you can't generate as much force when you're smaller, your area is smaller. So pressures are about the same for little kids. NICU, I know that's a little different. You have lower pressures, but not like most things in adults are three, four times a baby. Yes. Pressures are not three, four times. Um, so. PE max and PI max are measures that you can now. How do you measure it? That's the whole thing. I have a, there's an entire ATS document on how to measure pressures. Interesting. Okay, so now we're just going to go on to the other things that we're talking about. Volume. Volume, we all know what volume is. Length times length times length. Uh, the dimensions are length to the third. We're pretty consistent here. We measure in liters or milliliters. A milliliter is a cubic centimeter or a cc. Um, no. In North America, they still use, they use and, and in medicine, they use the SI system for, yes. for that. OK. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's true. We just had to be different. I had to relearn how to read a blood gas. Yeah. And how to talk to people about okay. So lung volumes. This is classic respiratory physiology. So you're sitting here breathing quietly, and that's your tidal volume from your from exhalation to inhalation and breathe out. Breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And then what the maneuvers are in pulmonary fracture is take a big breath in and then blow it out as much as you can, and then you go back. So all kinds of different volumes you can measure. You can even measure more volumes than this. But what we care about for ventilator is tidal volume and resting, um, uh, sorry, I got this wrong. This is not FRC. And expiratory lung volume is resting expiration up there. Okay. Um, and we have maximum inspiration, functional residual capacity, residual volume. So we really just care about tidal volume. We all know tidal volume is about seven mils per kilo. So that is the volume. It's related to how big you are. Okay. So but the other thing I want to point out is the respiratory system is the chest wall and the lungs. These are two separate pieces of the system that we combine and call one system. 
but I've got these pictures. So the question is, what happens if I take your lungs out of your chest? What do lungs want to do? If you want to take the lungs out of the chest. Yep. And you have the lung in the right. Yep, we take the lungs and we put them here on the table. What are they going to do? So they want to collapse. So, uh, yep. It's very compliant. So they have a they have no kind of because the chest wall, I guess, is working as um a boundary. So so they, they cannot expand unless the muscles are actually allowing them. So if you take them out, then I think with a very small amount of pressure or volume, then you're going to get more. No. It's gonna shrink. It's because... You're gonna shrink. Lungs no, want to collapse. Because the lungs want to is, because the intraflural space is kind of keeping it. Yep. So again, so even without taking like if I just open up your chest, your lung is going to collapse. Okay. But what happens if I take your chest, your thorax, out of the system? So, so what does your chest want to do? The chest wants to expand. The chest would get bigger without the lungs. The lungs would get smaller without the chest. And so there is a question. So this is um, uh, the pressure and volume relationships of the chest and the lungs. So think about this. So we've got relative measures here. Functional residual capacity, resting chest volume. OK, so um, at zero pressure, so if we take the chest away from everything, the chest is going to want to be at the resting chest volume. It's want to be up here at about four liters is an adult male. Once we have four liters, but it actually hangs out around two and a half liters. So it would want to pop open. But as you added pressure to that, at some point it's gonna, it's not gonna be able to increase that much. It's pretty, it gets pretty stiff. So you can't inflate the chest too much. It's not like a balloon. It's more like a propane cylinder, okay? So, um, but as you become negative, it's gonna get smaller. So if you start to take air out of a chest, it's gonna get smaller. But at some point, you're not gonna get any smaller gain like a, a um, propane cylinder. It's gonna stay about one liter no matter how much negative pressure you have. The lungs work completely opposite. So when you're at zero pressure, they're going to be the minimal lung volume. They want to really collapse. They hang out. Um, if you start to give them pressure, 10 centimeters, you start to expand them, expand them, expand them. And they're like a balloon. They would get bigger and then they'd pop somewhere out here. But the respiratory system becomes this line. Everything works together. So at zero, when we're not doing anything, we sit here at functional residual capacity. We just hang out there, okay? Um, now, you've, I'm sure you've all seen this. There is a difference between adults and newborns. The newborn chest is very compliant. We'll get to what I mean by compliant in a second, but it's very soft, it has to be. If it wasn't, you couldn't be born. So the chest is very compliant. So you see at zero pressure, an adult chest wants to build 50% of total lung capacity. At zero pressure, a infant chest wants to be much smaller, 30, 40%. So it tends to collapse. So this end expiratory volume is in the newborn is at 25% TLC. It's at 40% TLV in an adult. And okay. Nothing magic happens at 28 days of life that you go from this to this. This is what happens day one. You eventually get here probably when you're around 8 to 12 or something. So the young person's chest is more compliant, and that makes a difference. So what am I talking about compliance? There is a relationship between pressure and volume. When we're talking about something we're inflating or deflating, the relationship, the relationship is compliance. Compliance is the change in volume divided by the change in pressure. There are your dimensions. 
um, so we'll go back one. Interestingly, the slope of this line is the compliance. The slope of this is the compliance. So here we're getting we're the this is normal. We're just in the middle of teaching. Oh, I'm really sorry to interrupt. Shruti was looking for me to talk about Vivica, I think, and I couldn't get hold of her. She's inside, sorry. It's fine. She's around, is she? She's just in here. Perfect. Is she like this in her office? Is that all? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, in ventilators, we talk about static or dynamic. Um, when we've taken the lungs out, and we're inflating and we do step changes. We add 10 centimeters of water, we add 10 milliliters of air and we measure the volume. And we do this by step changes and it's static. We let the system come to rest. Now we can let the system come to rest on the ventilator, but we don't often do that because people are breathing all the time. So um, we often talk about a dynamic compliance, which is arguably not a true compliance in this sense, but we do measure it. Um, static compliance is PIP minus PEEP, or sorry, dynamic compliance is tidal volume divided by PIP minus PEEP. Static compliance is tidal volume divided by plateau pressure minus PEEP. And this is the example of a patient inhaling 500 milliliters of air from a spirometer with an interpolar pressure going from minus five to minus 10. And this is the compliance that you're going to get out of that. All these ventilators spit out a number for compliance all the time. Um, they're constantly spitting out a dynamic number, and you can measure a static number. Um, I don't look at the absolute number. I look at the trend. Although you can also see that just by thinking about what you're doing with the volume ventilator. If you're still volume ventilating, your pressure is coming down, your compliance is improving. OK, flow. Flow is much easier. We all know what flow is. Water is moving, water is flow. V dot is volume divided by time. We talk about, often in Bentley, we talk about two different, two, I'm gonna talk about two different flow rates. We talk about minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is a flow rate. It's a volume divided by a minute. So it's your volume over a minute is minute ventilation. Um, but we often talk about flow over seconds too so that comes up um now there is a it's not flow and resistance i have to change that flow and pressure let's say the say relationship it's between it's flow it's and it's pressure it's yeah this is your relationship between flow and flow and pressure it's resistance and this is your formula change in pressure divided by flow is your dimensions you have a tube, you have pressure one, pressure two, you have a delta pre across that, there is a resistance. Ignore the length and the radius because it's not relevant here. Remember, this is exactly the same as Ohm's law. Voltage across the circuit, if you remember this from, yeah, from, right, <laughs> from um, current times resistance, it's the same thing, um, which is resistance equals voltage divided by current. So your Flow is your current and your voltage is your pressure. Okay, thing. What is not important, what a lot of people like to talk about now is the Hagen Poiseuille equation and laminar flow and Reynolds number and turbulent flow. Not relevant. We don't care about that right now. Uh, I don't really care about rest in ventilators. <laughs> okay. So, so now you've got some pieces to start thinking about another model. So a model, you have conceptual models of everything. You can take it, so of course, because I'm an engineer, I like mathematical models. I, I like to build them with math in my head. You don't have to, you can, we used to have a model of disease with humors and fluids and bilious. It wasn't a very good model. It didn't get us very far, but we talked about it a lot. Um, so a model, 
and I should say a model may help to explain a system and the effects of different components of that system. And it may help make predictions of behavior. That's what we're interested in here, in having this model so we can predict, predict behavior because we're, we're trying to predict behavior and modify behavior on the ventilator. We have to remember though, it is not reality. Um, so it may be wrong and it may not help us. Okay, these are other conceptual models. So here's your trachea and a lung. This is a simple conceptual modeling of the respiratory system. You know, mechanical respiratory, representation or electro representation. These are all the same thing that we're gonna express in mathematical terms. This is yet another model of the cardiovascular and respiratory system. It can get more complex, it can. So what is the equation of motion of the respiratory system? That's where we're gonna go. So you can derive this from first principles using an energy balance, using that linear single compartment model. Let me go back. Quickly. Oops. There. Is this linear? It is over usually what we're interested in. It's mostly linear, but it's not linear out here. So we were starting to think, well, okay, we're approximating a system, um, but recognize it again, it's not reality. It's linear. We're saying that we have a linear system. Okay, but what you can derive is this. So the airway changes over time as the product of the flow over time times the resistance plus the elastance of the respiratory system times the volume over time um, plus your initial pressure. That can be arranged to delta P equals delta V divided by compliance plus resistance divided by flow plus inertance times the rate of change of flow. Again, that's a little too complicated to use here. So we're further simplifying something we've generated. So what are these things? So delta P is your pressure difference. C is your compliance. Delta V or delta P. Elastance is just the inverse of compliance. Resistance, we've talked about. Flow is flow. And inertance is it's a measure of how a system responds to a changing, a change of a change. But so inertness is negligible for our purposes. So we can drop that second term. Okay. Acceleration of flow is not an issue. Um, we're talking about the respiratory system, the respiratory system being the chest wall, the lungs, and in our situation, the ventilator, the ET tube, and at least some of your tubing. The delta V is your tidal volume. That's what we're putting in. And delta P is your peak inspiratory pressure minus your positive and expiratory pressure, PIP minus P. Okay, so that becomes that. PIP minus PP equals tidal volume divided by your compliance plus your resistance divided by your flow. I might have to have a big error message, but it's not resistance divided by flow, it's resistance times flow. It's resistance times flow. Yep, error in my thing, it's resistance time slow. I'll modify and send it. Okay, so your respiratory system is your ventilator plus circuit plus lungs plus chest wall. Your patient and your respiratory system characteristics are your compliance and your resistance. Those are defined. That's defined by the ventilator to be used and whatever disease is going on. You can't change that. Well. You can't change that by twiddling dials. We can change that by fixing what's wrong with the patient. The ventilator settings are PIP, PEEP, tidal volume, and flow, which is tidal volume divided by time. So it's really only three things, pressure, volume, and time. There are three variables that we can change. Pressure, volume, time, two degrees of freedom in the system. So we always set time, so you can set volume or pressure. You set volume, pressure comes out of it. You set pressure, volume comes out of it. That's what I mean when I say pressure ventilation is equivalent to volume ventilation for a defined system. So I can move back and forth. Some people, I prefer to think in terms of volume ventilation, but I can think in terms of pressure ventilation, but it's really the same thing at this level. 
Okay. Um, we're just start to see where this equation, which I've written wrong, I apologize. Oh, that's terrible. Resistance times flow. Um, where we use this. So time constants. What is a time constant? Anyone? Tau. It is it, the time constant is a nice number that characterizes the response to a step input of a first order linear system. Again, we're assuming this is a first order linear system. We give it the system something. What is it going to do? Well, one way to characterize it is the time constant. And you can see the dimensions are time. If you multiply resistance type compliance, it's going to come out in units of time. Um, and resistance and compliance give you time value. So it's what the system responds to. In but four to five time constants, a system will respond completely. So think about it. if your resistance is high, which it is, um, and your compliance is low, so you have very stiff lungs, non-compliant lungs, Sorry, if your resistance is normal and you have stiff lungs, your time constant is going to be short. It's it's going to respond very quickly to what you do. That's why you can get away with short eye times in neonatology because while your kids have RDS, they have stiff lungs, the resistance is fine. They can handle an uh, inspiratory time of, of 0.4. You do that with a kid with asthma who has a high resistance. Mm -hmm. and a normal compliance, you try and jam that breath in in 0.4 seconds, you're not going to respond. You're never, it's not going to accept that breath. Um, and that's what we talk about when we talk about um, expiratory flow limitation in asthma. It's the time class because there's so much resistance that we need to increase the eye time to put it in slowly to let them exhale or sorry so we shorten the eye times to let them exhale because we're talking about the expiratory time constant and it's the same so it's an exponential decay and that's this the prevent, so air trapping air trapping so you put the volume in there's exponential decay we have no control over that where expiration is passive so this exponential decay is defined by the time constant and there so again we can't control it by twiddling dials so i talk about we often talk about IE ratio, the inspiratory time ratio to the expiratory time. Let's talk about, I used to talk about t tote or the duty cycle, the total time you're using to breathe. These ventilators call it the breath cycle. The rate that you have is 60, 60 seconds divided by your t total. So if you have one second in, two seconds out, IE ratio of one to two, that's three seconds. And if you do that 20 times a minute, that gives you a rate of 20. Uh, 60 divided by three is 20. Okay. So our normal, it's always good to start with to start with something normal. So we talk about start with a normal tidal volume, seven mils per kilo, a normal respiratory rate. Again, that respiratory rate is very different as you age. Um, and um your IE ratio, what's your normal IE ratio as you're saying you're breathing? One so, to two. Well, about one to two. You breathe in and you breathe out for about twice as long. So the time constant characterizes the response to a step of a first first order linear system. Um the time constant of respiratory system is R times C. Okay. So when we start to talk about some of these things, when you're looking to ventilator, one of the things we like to look at is the volume pressure curve. Um, and all these ventilators will put up a volume pressure curve. Um, and these are all different things that have been in the literature. And sorry, yeah, you can read that. Um, that you'll hear different intensives talk about different things. So we start here at zero volume. We're just starting inhalation. And our pressure is at whatever our PEEP is set up. And we start to inhale, and then we're done inhalation. We reach our peak pressure, and we exhale, and we have this curve. Now we talk about this goosenecking. Here, 
this is this is our compliance. So our dynamic compliance is from this point to this point. Over here, we're not very compliant. The curve is flattening, or the slope of the line is flattening. We're getting less compliance. We are over distending the airways. We shouldn't have that much tidal volume. The other thing, as you can see, is the lower inflection point. We talk about the lower, actually, this is bad here. But here, they're suggesting you should probably increase the peak because only when you get to here have you opened up enough alveoli to be in a uh, nicely compliant part of the lung. So this is in your optimal compliance. You want to be right in this nice middle linear thing. Um, so these are things that people will talk about. Now, part of the problem is a lot of this stuff, while it's interesting to talk about, doesn't really follow through to hard outcome measures in terms of mortality morbidity. ARDS, which in adults has a lot of, is a pretty well defined, well, actually I would argue it's not a well-defined disease, but it's a compliance issue and a lot of ventilation on it. The only thing that makes much mortality difference, real difference is high peak low tidal volume, probably for this, but chasing compliance and resistance and things, it hasn't really worked out to be the great solution to how to mechanically ventilate. But this goes back to what I said, you can ventilate most kids here, um, even if you don't do it quite as nicely as, quite as prettily or obsessively as I might do it, they're gonna be fine. They're gonna recover from their illness. Um, so we just don't have the hard outcome measures. Worker breathing. So again, I don't expect you to, to remember, but this is another interesting thing. So again, remember from your high school physics or sixth form, I guess, what is work? If you push against the wall, but don't move the wall, are you doing any work? No, you're not. From an engineering perspective, you're not. Work is force times distance. You can do the unit analysis. If you multiply pressure times volume, you also get work, you also get joules. So, the ventilator, you can think about it it's doing work by moving a volume through a pressure, great, it's doing work. When you're breathing, you're doing work. From the engineering perspective, you're actually expanding joules. Now that there's efficiency of work and other things that you're, you're actually overcoming, but that's a big piece of the work is the pressure volume. And you can measure it. And this is a Campbell diagram and probably 10, 15 years ago, they were very keen on measuring work of breathing on weaning and transferring work of breathing from the ventilator to the patient. How do they respond to the increased work of breathing? Um, but again, it's, it's an area within the curve, pressure times volume. This is your work that, um, that you are doing to move that air. So, oh, I'm running out of time. I guess I didn't have as much time as I, or I didn't have as much. Um, this is a more recent thing. Uh, Marini is a big ventilator guy. He's the ventilator king in many ways. Um, and I'm going to send you this article. Um, this is kind of the latest thing on looking at these ventilator mechanics. Um, because the reason we're, we often care about peak pressure and tidal volume in this net is what we used to call barotrauma or pressure trauma. If we give too much pressure, it's bad for lungs. Well, it's, we actually used to talk about volume trauma, then barotrauma. Is it volume? Is it pressure? Well, we don't really know what it is. So now we talk about ventilator-induced lung injury. It's the ventilator itself. And this a lot of this stuff comes from neonates because we know if we ventilate neonate lung hard, it's not good for them. So the gentle as gentle as you can be, and if that's CPAP, that's CPAP, um, is the best to not produce the bad after effects. Again, neonates have a good outcome marker in BPD to know what they're doing. We don't have that um, in PICUs, but ARDS has that in terms of mortality and length of ventilation. But the link, while theoretical, is not that strong between what we're doing and what we're seeing. Um, so we have all these models of ventilator-induced lung injury, but linking it all up is not that great. So his point is, it's not your peak pressure. It's not your work. 
It's your energy, how much energy you're putting in the system. And this is actually pretty good at looking at a lot of these measurements and calculating the energy. So it's work over time is energy, how much excessive energy. And I think you could take that to any needs. You're putting less energy over time, they're putting less energy into a neonate's lungs because it's the energy that's causing the damage. Um, so I think it's a, it's a better way to look. It's starting the, I guess, the holy grail of this would be to really have something that you can measure the bedside to know we are doing lung damage here, um, but we can still achieve our ventilator, ventilator goals to maintain life and let them recover but minimizing the amount of ventilator induced lung injury. And we're measuring how much we're doing with this number on the machine. We don't have that yet. Um, maybe this is that number, I don't know. Um, that's actually all I have. So it was a little, what time is it? Oh no, that's, that's good. That's 45 minutes. Um, well, I'm gonna do this right now. I'm gonna fix my error. Um, but I'll let you ask some questions if you have any.